Shall we do Wolverine? X Men Origins colon Wolverine or X Men colon Origins dash Wolverine. Too much punctuation in a film title never. It's very look. I used to work for Sight and Sound. It's very very important. So um, following the sort of time on the thing that you know one's a hit, two's a crowd, three's a trilogy, four has to be a prequel because everyone thinks oh that's fun. So you know you do Star Wars, you do three, then you go back to the beginning. So the story is this is the backstory of how Wolverine became Wolverine, starring Mr. Huge Action, who I actually quite like generally. I think I mean I liked I was the I was the critic who liked Australia. Me and Chris Tookie of the Daily Mail, and what we see is the backstory of him and his brother, later by Liv. That's a girl's name, Shirley Schreiber. <laughs> they are they are together, discover that they're brothers. There is a terrible paternal accident. They run off, discovering that they have wolf-like, nay, dog-like powers. I'm doing Mr. Manor in glasses again. And then we see a montage of them in a series of wars, because obviously they have these sort of super abilities. They're in a series of wars. Interestingly enough, the last war they end up in is they go to D-Day. And it's not D-Day, it's clearly Saving Private Ryan. It is really interesting how D-Day has now actually become Saving Private Ryan. If you want to show somebody in D-Day, you don't show the beach. What you do is you show that shot of Tom Hanks, you know, sitting at the front of the boat waiting with the thing. And there's not a, not a tripod. Yeah, exactly. Not a tripod in sight. Everybody on D-Day had wobbly cameras. So they go through D-Day. And then, of course, he meets up with the guy who says to him, you have special powers. I'm going to make you invincible. Come and join me here. Fingers crossed is a clip. We're going to make you indestructible, but first, we're going to have to destroy you. That you will be able to withstand virtually anything. It's called adamantium. You're going to have to embrace the other side. Become the animal. Let's do this. I almost forgot. I want new ones. You want them to say Wolverine. So now, as Stephen was pointing out, saying, to, haven't we seen some of the? Haven't we been in that bit? And haven't mm. we? I'll be brutally honest with you about this. I've kind of lost track because there is a point. <laughs> yeah. There is a point during it because the thing with the, the X Men movies when they were at their best, they sort of had something to say about you know alienation and about racism and about politics. At their best, that's what they did. At its best, what this does is it gives you something that has better special effects than Teen Wolf 2, but doesn't actually have much more to give you. And there's a number of problems. The first one is that it's one of those movies that assumes that characters being incredibly indestructible and able to withstand anything falling on them, and anything being rammed through them, is exciting. My big problem is, in order for me to be interested in a movie, I have to invest in the possibility that the hero or anti-hero is in some kind of danger when they're running around from things exploding and things falling down on them. The minute somebody turns out to be utterly indestructible, I simply don't care. The other problem with it is that it, it, there is this idea that somehow backstory is fundamentally interesting. And there's a reason why backstory is backstory it's backstory you know most directors do that thing but you know the actor will, David will know more about this than me they'll say you know I want to do some research on the backstory that's fine go away research where the person went to school research where they grew up and you know what come to the set and don't say a thing about it if it helps the way you hold your face when you're in the middle of a fight then brilliant but what we don't need to see is them standing up and saying hello my name is so and so I was born in Thringly Bong and then Diddly Bong happened to me and then what this other bit it's a, because it's backstory I don't essentially care there's a moment in Wolverine in which a, one of the characters says to another one I would kill you but and there's a pause and you can literally hear the audience going but you're alive in the next three films <laughs> so I can't and there is a terrible sense I mean I, I know that there have been you know great uh, I mean I think what Chris Nolan has done with the Batman movies and Batman Begins is very very interesting but that's because essentially he's not doing backstory he's making a movie that just happens to be temporarily placed before the stuff that we know and David and Stephen, during that uh, splendid oration, nodding furiously. Yeah, I think it's true about backstory. It's exactly what you don't want people to see or know. You know, it's what you do. You work on it, and but you don't want. You know, the last thing you want is the audience to, to know all that or to tell them. You know, you, it's it's for you only, and maybe you might share it with your director. But it's not <laughs> the, you know, if it's not in the script, people shouldn't know about it. At no, all. you forget it. I'm, an obvious example is when you're playing someone in real life, as uh, Bill Goldman, the great screenwriter, says. You know, the uh, a screenplay the the narrative is a piece of string. You choose where to cut it at the beginning and where to cut it at the end. It obviously went on before and it would obviously go on afterwards because life does. Um, and, and you don't need to know what the string was before or what the string will be. Yeah, after. that's for you only. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I work on backstory, but nobody else gets to know it. It's just for me to fill in the gaps and sort of 
do something. Yeah. But you work there. very hard at that, don't you? Yeah, it's, it's sort of fill it in. You know, you're filling in the gaps and it gives you a chance to sort of build up the character, but it's for nobody else to, to know or it's nobody else's business. I'll just say it very quickly, as always, the BBFC did the most astute review of this. When they talk about giving the film a 12A certificate, they said, it is always obvious that we are looking at a fantastic world that has little in common with reality. <laughs> it's a strange thing that the BBFC are actually employing some of the best film critics in the country, because that's exactly the problem with the film, is that you are just effectively watching a video game. And in the absence of there being any threat, what you think is going to fill the gap is some kind of emoting. But sadly, in the case of Wolverine, emoting comes down to a guy with slightly strange facial hair, which makes him look like the lead singer at the Kurzweil Flyers, howling at the moon. And it's like, mm, not really enough.